The Poetry of Uncertainty. According to Alexandra Harris, Chair of the Forward Prizes 2020, in times of distraction, poetry can carve out a space of concentration. Poems can shake or shock or magnetise our ideas into new configurations. In this lecture, I'll be briefly considering poetry's urgency during moments of heightened social and cultural crisis and asking how the form and language of poetry, so often derided for being opaque, obtuse or ambiguous, is part of its necessary and magnetising effect. On April 6th, towards the end of the second week of lockdown in the UK, the BBC Europe editor, Katja Adler, together with her daughter, Sophia, read out the poem, The Stolen Orange by Brian Patton on Radio 4's flagship morning news platform, Today, part of their embedded comfort and hope programme whereby famous correspondents shared their favourite poems. I'm reading this poem with my daughter, Sophia, Katja explained by way of introduction because she's about the same age I was when I first discovered this poem, fell in love with it and took courage from it. The Stolen Orange. When I left, I stole an orange. I kept it in my pocket. It felt like a warm planet. Everywhere I went, smelt of oranges. Whenever I got into an awkward situation, I take out the orange and smell it. And immediately, on even dead branches, I saw the lovely and fierce orange blossom that smells so much of joy. When I went out, I stole an orange. It was a safeguard against imagining there was nothing bright or special in the world. Each week, the Today programme has 17.7 million listeners. The playback of the reading of The Stolen Orange on Twitter has received over 50,000 views. During those first few scary, jittery, high octane fueled weeks, poetry was suddenly ubiquitous. As though there was a direct correlative, at least in the minds of BBC programmers, if not amongst the nation at large, between crisis, personal, political, social, national and poetry. The prominence of poetry during this time has surprised even me. I've grown accustomed to thinking of poetry as having a small though admittedly devoted following, these days made up mostly of poets themselves. During poetry spats so ferocious, they sporadically spell out onto the pages of The Guardian, one sometimes gets the uncomfortable sense of a minority art form rather pointlessly at war with itself. And who has time for poetry nowadays anyway, with its unnecessary difficulties and demands on our concentration on the one hand, and with our lateral mental processing and ever decreasing attention spans on the other. Yet poetry remains something we reach towards, hark back to, yearn for. Poetry in the form of nursery rhyme is the first thing we memorise without even having to try. And at the other end of life, poetry learned by heart in childhood can persist through the blizzard of Alzheimer's as the one constant the mind can retain. In between our core ceremonial moments, births, marriages, funerals are frequently marked by poems as though profound personal transition cries out to be amplified via the inherently ritualized sonic structures of poetry. Here I'm thinking of poem as spell or incantation of language assembled into the magic configuration of the best words in the best order, as Coleridge described it, in order to capture, condense, magnetise and ultimately transform experience. One only has to think of great Russian poets from the 30s, such as Anna Akhmatova or Osip Mandelstam. 
or of the flowering of poetry from Northern Ireland during the Troubles by such poets as Seamus Heaney and Karen Carson, to perceive how crisis can act as a crucible to poetic talent. Here Heaney would undoubtedly have preferred the analogy of the blacksmith's forge or smithy, though the effect of transmutation is common to both. Standing in a freezing queue in Leningrad, waiting to hand over a parcel to her incarcerated husband, Akhmatova was asked by the woman in front of her, can you describe this? Yes, I can, she answered, in a profound act of trust in both her own talent and her medium, and proceeded to write her masterpiece, Requiem, a lasting document, The Great Terror. Under unimaginable circumstances, poetry for both poets and readers became dearer than existence itself. When Mandelstam read his Stalin epigram to a private group of friends, he knew he was jeopardizing his life. After his inevit inevitable death, his wife Nadezhda memorized his poems for years until they could be safely published because she didn't trust writing them down. Returning then to oranges, what is it about the form and language of poetry, which as Adler puts it, inspires falling in love and even courage? What is it about poetry as an art form that might be worth such risk? There are certain obvious, almost incidental tendencies of poetry, which render it perfect for slotting into the Today programme amidst the standard deluge of headlines, interviews, racing tips and commentaries on terrible news. Though by no means always the case, poetry can often be short and can often be written in simple language, as the stolen orange is. Rather like thought for the day then, a poem such as this one offers a moment of islanded introspection for the listener, a pause in the routine of a busy breakfast, a counter signal. What other literary art form can deliver so much in under a minute, requiring no more from its audience than a listening ear? But there's far more to poetry's power than this. Part of poetry's hypnotic appeal is bound up with its intermeshing of the written and the oral, the private and the public, the personal and the collective. Poems are simultaneously complex and hospitable spaces, and they are hospitable precisely because of that complexity. What they have to say can be transmitted very quickly. And yet their resonances can endure like a struck bell and even deepen and change through time. Poems are not ciphers for meaning. Poems don't contain their secrets like locked jewellery boxes, which we have to work at opening with all those terrible technical terms for tools hammered into us in school. Alliteration, onomatopoeia, iambic pentameter. Instead, a poem's meaning is generated in the charged interplay between text and reader-listener. Poems can be gifts or trophies or the spoils of suffering, carried in the pocket like a brilliant orange. My heart is in my pocket. It is poems by Pierre Reverdy, as Frank O'Hara puts it, were memorised and carried in the mind for a lifetime. They are alive with paradox. In her essay, Sing It Again, Karen Soli writes about poetry in the age of climate crisis. What can a poem do, she asks, in the face of the extinction of all we know? A crisis of such proportion, COVID-19 fades by comparison. What is the point, she asks, of poems that meditate on woodpiles or trains or illness, that record romantic heartbreak or ironic encounters with signage? Speaking of Alice Oswald's poem about a dead swan, Swan, Soli asserts, when Alice Oswald's swan 
diverges from its astonishing imagistic devotions to the dead creature and heads off across a field of allegory. I feel my mind setting out across that expanse, accompanied by the poem. Feel physically the poem's divergence, its deepening. It's an experience doubled in a charge of transformation, both solitary and shared. After experiencing a great poem, things often look a little different. And change, however small, affirms the capacity for change. In her own poem, Clarity, also about a dead bird, in this case a gannet, perhaps inspired by Oswald Swan, Sully explores the precise combination of simplicity and directness of address on the one hand and multiplicity of meaning on the other at the heart of poetry's magnetizing effect during times of fear, disorder and distraction. Clarity. In the centre of the path, near the ruined Bothy, styrofoam maybe, a sweater, fishing gear. As I approached, I saw it was a gannet how odd. How long then before I realised it was dead? When did my sixth receiver register the hydrostatic pressure of fluid newly at rest between subject and object? Bill beneath its wing, the head's saffron seemed a signal that should fade in death. What killed it had not been vain in its signature, allowing for the venerable feet to be tucked as is the instinct under the quilt of its body. Cormorants presided the way they do over the seas many funerals. Rocks spoke through its forms, the eulogy. The smaller is not the lesser stone. The day's warm air had cold ribboned through it, like a hotel atrium built around a stream, or the childhood swimming hole fed by an artesian current, I visualised as darker than the surrounding water and more coherent, its integrity having not yet degraded. Much of what I feared then has happened, though not always as I'd feared, and so much more to fear than I'd imagined. On an afternoon beneath the Quirang, we watched the gannets dive, looked from the cliff edge straight through the clear water to the origins of variety. Like Oswald's swan, clarity is about the act of perception itself, a deliberate mapping of an external thing, a dead gannet, onto an internal system of signs in order to try to better understand what's being witnessed. At first, the speaker gets it wrong. Styrofoam, maybe, a sweater, fishing gear. But as she draws nearer, the puzzle resolves itself. As I approached, I saw it was a gannet. How odd. But if objects have at first been reached for which don't quite fit, the poem coming so oddly to a halt with the gannet itself, which does. The rest of the poem is then set free to take off across the same field of allegory she identifies in Oswald's poem as the transformative point of departure. Now through the twin engines of simile and metaphor of things being described in terms of other things 
the poem comes into its own. From the undertaker cormorants presiding over the sea's many funerals to the rocks speaking the eulogy. The gannet's living context is offered back to us as a scene of collective anthropomorphized mourning. The cold in the day's warm air similarly transports the speaker and by extension us to a hotel atrium or a swimming hole from her own childhood in a central analogy which balances purity against degradation and temporary coherence against impending dissolution. These journeys away from the blunt fact of the dead gannet enrich and multiply the poem's many significances. Bellwether of looming disaster, interlocutor for nature as a whole, or mutely unreadable other. Throughout the dead gannet remains at the poem's heart for us to make of what we will. In the concluding image, of absolutely clear seawater granting access to the origins of variety, the poem deftly fuses its own central paradox of direct looking and multiplicity of meaning in a stunning final flourish. And as things slip, become other things and come back, change, however small, affirms the capacity for change, leaving us with adaptability, that most precious resource of all, in the face of so much more to fear than we'd imagined.